So today's pitching panel featuring Eric Gagne and Ed Lynch will be moderated by Barry Bloom. I think a lot of people know Barry. He's been here before. Barry was a longtime reporter and columnist for MLB.com, for numerous magazines and newspapers. He's a longtime friend, and now I will turn it over to him, and he'll take over. Oops. Yeah, and just I'll let you guys be the first to know that uh, I just signed a contract to do baseball columns yesterday for Forbes, which will be a nice new little uh, wrinkle Good for you. And uh, thank you. Be doing my sports business stuff and baseball stuff, and uh, be a great outlet to uh, to work for as we move forward. So, I mean, the two guys sitting next to me. Uh, I mean, I covered their career. You know, I think uh, you know I joked around. In, we, Ed was at the fall conference, and you know, he just did a great job. Uh, I mean, really, uh, how long? You, you were with the group for maybe over an hour, right? I yeah, mean, I think so. We went out into the stands, and we talked. And you know, one of my favorite Ed Lynch stories is when I was uh, a rookie reporter, and I really was a rookie reporter. We were at Candlestick Park, and he was with the Mets. He had an eight-year career, <clears throat> most of it with the Mets, uh, last couple of years with the Cubs. And, uh, you know, there was a, uh, another pitcher who was pitching for the Mets at the time who was a young hotshot. And I'm even blanking on his name right now. Tim Leary. Yeah, Tim Leary, right. And so uh, in Candlestick Park, there is a numbers on the locker and no names. And I didn't know what Leary's number was. And I was looking for Leary. But, of course, I didn't know what he looked like. So I went and I picked Lynch. And he did the interview with me for about 10 minutes, as if he were Larry. <laughs> and then at the end of the, the interview, he said, you know, by the way, you know, I, 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 I punked you on this. I'm not, well, that's the term for it now. But he said, uh, you know, I'm not Tim Leary. So that was like my, one of my comeuppances. As I was just happy somebody reporter. was willing to talk to me at that point. <laughs> Is that like the old, uh, the old Jewish mother phone call? Does that mean you're not coming? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've known him. Obviously, this goes back into the 80s and 70s. Well, you started in... 80. Yeah, so my first year as a reporter was like 1976. So by 1980, I should have done better, but I didn't. And then this guy here, uh, he, uh, he was pitching for the Dodgers uh, when one of my favorite people, you know, Jim Tracy, was managing. And uh, I think it was Tracy, was it, that turned you from a starter into a closer? Yeah, Trace and uh, Dave Wallace. These yeah. two are big, really big influence in my career. Yeah, th and, and so, he, you know, this guy goes on to have, you know, one of the, uh, one of the best seasons ever. And what, what did you have, 70 saves in a row at one point? 84. 84. <laughs> I, I don't. Who's counting, right? But who's counting? But who's counting? Right? So, you know, just for the analytic part of it, and I was teasing them about this earlier, I just wanted to look up, you know, eight, even, you know, basically Ed had eight complete games in, in his career. Yeah, I had six in one year. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the whole major leagues last year had something like 35, if that. If that. I mean, it, it averaged like under three a team. So that be, means he was, you know, a uh, in this era would be like one of the top pitchers. He would be, uh, you know, the late Roy Halladay, who actually, you know, was the last guy who regularly completed games in my book. But we were joking about it because, you know, his WAR is like 6.4, and uh, I thought that was good. <laughs> and Gagne's is like 11.4. And, you know, we were here the other day when Jay Jaffe was doing his presentation, and Jaffe said, you know, Hoffman doesn't belong in the Hall of Fame. He's got a 28 war. Well, it still, you know, it still means that when these guys were on the mound, uh, you know, they, they were 11 wins or 7 wins better than the, the replacement player. So, I mean, for you guys, what... What, what's your take on war? I mean, I, I think it's a convoluted stat. I'm not big on it. I think I, I use it as a metric just among everything else. Uh, it's, the Jaws, which I think Jaffe does for Hall of Famers, I think is, is kind of valuable. 
but it, it, it's all, all an equation, and you know, my mantra on it is kind of like the Edwin Starr war, what is it good for? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Guys, what do you think about it? Start ahead, with you. Well, to me, it's important. I'm here, first of all, to learn a lot. And war, I know what it is. I knew what it was. And uh, I think it is something to look at. But as a baseball player, I call it old school, whatever you want to call it. I think it's important to know that there's a lot of variables. And that's what we're good at, variables. There's a lot of numbers out there. And uh, that's why I'm here. I think I want to really understand what's behind the numbers. And you know, I was I went to Rangers now, and uh, I love talking baseball, which you know, numbers or whatever you want to call it. And I think it's important to have a conversation instead of a confrontation about the numbers. I mean, just to sit down, understand for me to understand what you guys know, and to translate that to the pitchers. That's the most important thing. War is war. Whatever you guys want to, you know, Hall of Famer or not, I think there is variables. I know you guys don't like variables, but it is part of baseball, and. Uh, I think we need to really sit down and have a conversation about that. To me, Hall of Famers, guy, what have you done in your era and, you know, dominating your era? I don't think it's comparable to go, compa you know, compare eras. I don't think it's possible. I mean, you look at hockey players 50 years ago to now, it's totally different. I mean, the rules are different, vice versa. And, uh, you know, I'm just glad I had great seasons. I'm just glad I went out there. I know what I did for my team was really valuable. And uh, to me, my guys knew that, and that's pretty much what I think about war. How about you, Ed? Well, f first of all, I was telling Barry this in the, in the lobby that, you know, anything that increases the popularity of our game, I'm all in on. And, you know, to see the number of people here for this, if this was 30 years ago, if this is 1988, and we're in a, there'd be nobody here. But this has created another dynamic, another fan base, and I think it's great. I, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely great. And baseball has held, with, you know, other than some bumps in the road that we'll talk about later, juice balls, steroids, whatever, but the great thing about our game over the century is that you can look at Chuck Klein in 1937 and say, you know, that's a pretty good year, you know? I don't think you look at Crazy Legs Hirsch in 1951 with the Los Angeles Rams and extrapolate that forward to see how he'd be as an NFL player now. So I think numbers are the great constant in our game over, over the last century and a half, and I think it's great. War, for me, uh, you know, I, first thing I did was look at the definition. It seems that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Barry, but it seems like certain teams calculate it differently. You know, they put different numbers in there to calculate the final number of war. And uh, I remember when I was with Toronto, I asked our, stat, our analytics guy, Joe Sheehan, I said, um, you know, uh, Verlander, when he had one of those great years, when he won the Cy Young and the MVP, he won 24 games and his war was eight. So I said to our guy, I said, now he's only eight games better than a replacement pitcher. Is that replacement pitcher going to win 16 games? And he said, well, you have to assume that replacement player is going to pitch a complete game every time he goes out on the field. And I'm like, that's a pretty good freaking <laughs> replacement player, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm going to give that guy a replacement player a a long-term deal. So right there, I, I you know, I kind of like, you know, my old school just went, Jesus Christ Almighty. But, um, <clears throat> but it, it obviously has value because it has stood the test of time. But I just wish that it didn't look like the statistics classes I took in college when I'm trying to figure out how to figure it out. And I'd like to see it translate into something more than just some theoretical thing. You know, okay, we're going to sign this guy because his war is higher than that guy. I don't know if it's, it's, if it's that precise yet. Well, and then keep in mind that, you know, you have a law degree, right? And you, you, you also passed the bar, so. I, I didn't take it. You didn't take no, it, No, because I got a job, I graduated in December, and Joe McElvain offered me a job as farm director in San Diego in November, so I was still in law school getting paid by the Padres. And I, you know, I didn't want to take the chance of taking the bar exam, so I was gone. I, I left January 1st to go to San Diego. Did you get the degree? Did you find Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got the degree. And where'd you get that from? University of Miami, Florida. Okay, so, so, you, so you have a guy here who's really, I consider to be, these are two people who are highly intelligent and analytical about what they do and what they think, whether it's their politics, their, their view of the game. So I, I, I think what they have to say, you know, is very important. And you know, aside from knowing Ed as just the, you know, as a pitcher early, you know, I was covering the Padres 
when McIlvain joined the Padres and he brought in, you know, Ed and John Barr and Ed has turned, Ed turned into obviously general manager of the Cubs and a longtime scout. Uh, you know, John Barr has been, what's he, head of player development? No, for, scouting uh, director yeah. for the Giants and when he, they won three World Series. Those right. were all his players on the field. Right, he drafted Lincecum and Posey and you know, Bumgarner and you just go down the list. So these are, that Padre organization back then under McIlvain had really one of the, one of the great staffs developmental-wise of all time, maybe not at the time, but if they had stayed with it for a longer period. Yeah, Kevin Towers was there too, God yeah, rest his soul. Right, Kevin Towers was there. So uh, Riggleman was there, yep. you know, Bochy was there. Boach, yeah. yeah, so I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of talent uh, they had. And, and just digressing a little, I mean, off the, the 1984 Padre championship team, you know, you have you know, Williams, Gossage, and Gwynn are all Hall of Famers who played on that team. And you're going to have another one. Bochy is the backup catcher, and he's going to ultimately be in the Hall of Fame. So, I mean, it's really uh, an, an amazing uh, amount of talent. So just to put a little fun before we split off the war thing, uh, my contention is that it would be a lot more fun if there was a face of war. And my, you know, who is that replacement player? I joke about this online all the time and on Twitter. And you know, my suggestion, even to Jaffe the other day, was for the, you know, regular players, uh, everyday players, that that, you know, face of the replacement player should be Moonlight Graham, <laughs> who is the uh, it, 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 the guy in Field of Dreams. And he only had one at bat, though. Right? No, he didn't exactly. get an at bat. Yeah, he had an at bat. No, he didn't get an at bat. So he did in the movie, but not in he played right field, and then this. Season well, ended. It's perfect. <laughs> I mean, that, that's your replacement player. At, you know, he was also in, you know, Kinsella's book, Shoeless Joe, which the movie was based on. And if any of you guys have not read Shoeless Joe or any of Kinsella's book, Iowa, Iowa Baseball Confederacy, they are great phasmatorical books about baseball that nobody should miss. But who, you guys to have a little fun with it, as a pitcher, who would be your your replacement player? <laughs> this is that this is a good one. I don't know. I mean that's why that's why to me that's why this needs to be a conversation. I mean that's you know, high leverage situation, everything like this and of course everybody thinks relievers or closers are overrated. That's fine. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but who do you replace these guys with? I mean there's uh that's why we called it a free agent market. It is a free market. There's a reason why they pay these guys that much money. And uh, I think those variables are really important, too. I know, I know you can't really count on those. I know there's not, it's not easy to look at it and see on paper, but it's something. And that's why, that's why for us, too, the guys with, the guys are pro to understand variables, baseball guys, old school, whatever you want to call it, it's important to really listen and really learn from what you guys are talking about because it needs to be relatable. And that, to me, the biggest thing is, you can't have too much of a gap with the front office and the players, or at least the coaches. The players don't need to know much. I mean, that's what we're here for, teach, and really take that data, really utilize that, and uh, really learn how to teach with it. I mean, I'm talking about Trackman, Rapsodo, all these things that are really important. Now with the launch angle with the guys, the hitters, pitchers need to know, understand that, what they're trying to do. And for me, it's important to really learn that and have a, have a conversation. Ed? Well, I, I did some research um, last night getting ready for today just to you know just to illustrate my own mind uh, the pitching where we're at pitching wise in Major League Baseball last year 2017 correct me if I'm wrong guys but 755 pitchers appeared in a major league game last year now some of those are position players but when you round it out you're talking about 25 per club times 30 so <laughs> that replacement player is is in the big leagues, you know, he's, he's here. And uh, see, for me, a replacement player is, and I remember we, we'd had this issue in the mid nineties in Chicago. Okay. Kerry Wood needs an extra day. His elbow's kind of tender. Okay. We don't have anybody to start Tuesday at home against the Dodgers. So I got to go down to AAA. And I remember we did this with Andrew Lorraine once we brought up our best uh, AAA pitcher and, you know, some people, Andrew was more than this because he got some time in the big leagues, but a lot of baseball people call that a 4A player. You know, you know we've all seen him. And, 
it's a guy that, that does well in AAA, and he just can't get over the hump in the big leagues. I mean, that, that, to me, that's a replacement player. And it's a scary thing. I mean, you know, you love these guys. You have confidence in them. But usually that replacement player is going to be a veteran for pitching, a veteran guy that's pitching in AAA, and now you need to bring him up to replace somebody in the rotation. And it's not pretty. It really isn't. It, most times it, it doesn't really end well especially when Andrew came up and the wind was blowing out at Wrigley Field about 40 miles an hour. I mean, it was just an awful, I've been there and it's an awful experience. So to me, that's who the replacement player would be. That 4A guy that you need to fill a gap for a day or two. Um, so if any of you guys have uh, questions, uh, write them down on a piece of paper and uh, they'll collect them in the back of the room and we'll have like a 15 minute question and answer, 10 minute question and answer period at the end of this where, uh, you know, we'll be able to uh, look at those questions. So, Eric, the, the Barry Bonds, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the great confrontations of all time, and, you know, you guys played in the middle of the steroid era, and, you know, there were all the stuff about know, taking it straight on about both of you. But Barry has always told me the story about, uh, you know, there was a game at 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 and T Park where the two of you either made a bet or something, and Bonds said to you, "Throw the hardest pitch you can, and let's see what happens with it." <laughs> and so. We why don't you happened, right? yeah, <laughs> predict that he, outcome? <laughs> they hit it into the center field bleachers. That's right. So, but I've never heard it, the story from your end. And you said there was also, I, I, I remember the trip you guys were on in Japan in yeah. 2002. You That's tell where that it story started. Too. I mean, I don't know if you guys remember those chickens that we used to put in the right field. Everybody walked them. I think you had 200 some walks that year. 230, 230 and, yeah, and eight yeah. in 2004. Some ridiculous. Yeah. Yes. That's. Uh, no, 120, 120. Runs runs bat. I think he was yeah. hitting a home run every five or six at bat, something it, ridiculous like this. But. Yeah, 2004 was 232 walks and 120 intentional, both records. And he was wondering why I wouldn't pitch to him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, we're in Japan. We had a trip, about two week trip, all star, major league all star, facing the Japanese team. And uh, Barry always complains about, you guys never face me, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no one's going to face you. That makes no sense to face you. I'm in there, safe situation, one run or two runs. I said, you know what? If I get a three-run lead one time, come in, I'll face you. I promise. And uh, that was probably a year later or something like that. But he goes, all right. He goes, all fastball. I'm like, no, not all fastball. I said, I can use one off speed. He goes, perfect, but no changeup. I'm like, oh, all right. All right, that's a deal. So. I think we're up by three. I think it was 4-1 or 3 nothing. I can't remember exactly. And then uh, I got a guy on first base, and he's on deck. And everybody knows he changes, it. He changes the way you look at it. You look at guys in front of him and behind him. Who can I face without facing him? And I looked at him. He looks at me. He looks at the score. I'm like, yep, I guess it is that time. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, let's do this. And uh, to me, I was on top of my game. That was the best I've ever pitched, I think. And I think he was the best I ever walked the face of the earth. So for me, as a kid from Montreal, didn't even expect to be a baseball player. I'm like, this is, you know, this is the pinnacle of my career, pretty much. So I get there, and I'm, like, I'm going to throw as hard as I can. And I did that. You know, first pitch was a strike. Second pitch, I think it was a strike. Got to 0-2. Start going up and in, because he had one hole that was inside under his big, huge metal thing he had on his elbow. So I really had to uh, go in hard, and at you know, I think it was one two. I'm like, I got him. I'm gonna throw that curveball back door, and I did throw it. It was really good, but it was off a little bit. The thing about Barry is he was never off balance. I mean, he was never ever off balance. He had the best end eye coordination I've ever seen, and he was going out there. He knew he was gonna get you, and that that little edge, that advantage, that he knew he wasn't gonna miss his pitch, and he didn't swing. It was off. I wish I would have got, got that call, but it was off a little bit. And then I came back in, I'm like, I got him. I slowed him down. It was a 68-mile-an-hour curveball. So I'm, I'm going back in hard, as hard as I can, right on his kneecap. And uh, I did that. It was a perfect pitch. He turned on it like nothing. It was 101 mile an hour. He turned on it. It basically, he just went to Mikovic Cove. And there's no way you should keep that, that fair. I mean, but he almost did. I think he missed by five or six feet. 
I'm like, all right, that's that's pretty impressive. So it was a foul. That's a foul. It was a foul. That, was a foul. From a that didn't Cove. count. So I'm like, ah, whatever. But well, he, the way he remembered it was that was the home run. But I'd seen the. No, tape. that was a foul. Yeah, right. that was yeah. a foul ball. Right. No, he hit a bomb, but way off. So whatever. Then I'm like, all right, I got him. I got him away. So uh, I go up and in. I'm mean, I go up back up and in so I can open up the outside. I go in, and I think I got to two two. And I'm, I'm going down the way, perfect. And I threw as hard as I could. I came back a little bit over the middle, and he almost hit my head off. And they went out the center field in San Francisco, and it's cold. I mean, it's not warm. The ball doesn't go anywhere. And it really was off the ground. It just took off. You know, it went out probably in one second. It was unbelievable. <laughs> and uh, I came back in, watched the video, and my video guy's like, why are you smiling? I'm like, this is the best time of my life right there. I mean, I faced the best one that ever walked the face of the earth. I gave everything I got, and he beat me twice. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so uh, that was the whole Barry Bonds thing. And, you know, I think he's got a lot of respect for me because of that. And uh, I knew, you know, I, I had a pretty good idea he was going to beat me, but that was pretty cool. So <laughs> uh, the, the 200, just a side note on the 200, 2004 season for Bonds, you know, he had 373 official at bats that year <clears throat> with uh, – you know, 150 some odd hits and the 232 walks and Jesus. eight or nine hit buys. And when you look at the stats, he actually was on base like three or four times more than he had official at bats, which is like one of the most mind boggling stats, I think, in history. And then you look at that and, you know, uh, you know, you have all the steroid allegations and, you know, the Balco and all, all that stuff. And then the stuff you went through, Eric, uh, you know, where, where do you think those not, I mean, because of the way he changed the game and how people pitched to him for whatever reason, you know, he wound up winning batting titles in his early 40s and late 30s. Is he a Hall of Famer for you, or what, what, what do you think? And, Ed, you can follow up. Okay. Uh, he's 100% a Hall of Famer in my book, of course. I mean, that's, for me, statistically, is, it's ridiculous. He changed the game. I mean, we were going out there. We used to have pitchers meeting. Everybody had it, you know, their new method about getting Barry out. You can't get Barry out. You couldn't do that. I mean, he was just so in control of his body. He understood the game, and he understood counts. He understood what pitchers are trying to do or certain, you know, certain counts. He wasn't just that good. He was unbelievably smart. That guy went out there with a plan. He never, ever did anything else outside his plan. He adjusted faster than anybody else. And I think that, to me, that was the most impressive thing. I mean, I know the steroid thing and everything else probably – Everybody thinks he's going to hit that many home runs more, whatever. I get that, and I'm not going to argue with you guys. All I know is I've never seen someone dominate a lineup like that and change a game, change the way you pitch to other pitcher, to other hitters the way that Barry did. For, for me, that's, that's Hall of Fame stuff. What do you think, Ed? Well, this is a real difficult question. I, I could understand Barry's thinking, because I remember in 98 when I was GM of the Cubs, we had the whole circus with Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. I mean, it was a phenomenon. I mean, every day we come to the ballpark, it'd be 300 media there. You remember those days, Barry. It was ridiculous. It was, it was like the World Series every day. At the end of the year, when we made the playoffs, it's like, wow, I can relax now. There isn't much, as many media people here now. <laughs> Because we have like a Tuesday day game in July, and there's 250 writers at the game. And Sammy loved it. He loved it. And Mark McGuire didn't like it so much, but he, he went with it. And I guarantee you Barry Bonds is sitting at home and arguably the best player in the game. And he's like, I'm, I'm doing this clean, and, and I got to look at this. You know, the hell with this. You know, I'm going to even the playing field. Now, that's a conscious decision he made. He was certainly a Hall of Famer if he never took any drugs in his life. I mean, he was that good before that. But, you know, like the seasons he had, I mean, is he a Hall of Fame in a, in a vacuum looking at those numbers? My God, they should build a wing for him. It makes Babe Ruth's 1921 season look like a replacement player, you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, this is a guy, statistically, as I said, in a vacuum, shit, Hall of Fame. But, you know, we've got to, uh, here, here's another problem, you know, we've got to have rules. And if you break the rules, there are consequences. But there are guys who got in who were probably doing the same thing. And just because they weren't in the Mitchell report or they weren't, you know, didn't get investigated and charged, then they, they got through. So it's a very difficult question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just glad I don't have to vote because there are guys that I think belong in the Hall of Fame, Lee Smith being one of them, one of my teammates. But that's a very tough question. And uh, if, I had to, if I had to come up with an answer, 
it's just hard for me to, to just ignore that. It really is. And, uh, but there's no question about his greatness, none. Yeah, the, and full disclosure, I've been a Hall of Fame voter since 1992, and uh, I voted for Clemens and Bonds every year they've been on the ballot. So, you know, because I look at it in terms of <clears throat> it was a steroid era. Either everybody did it or nobody did it. You can't, you have to look at it in absolutes because except for the players who tested positive or admitted it or suspended, you really had no, uh, you know, knowledge of who did what. Yeah. And, you know, you both can speak to the fact that, you know, these, this all started, you know, in 98, there was really limited rules in the, in the, in the basic agreement about this. No, there was and, none. Well, I mean, there was just cause if you remember, and, and when Andrew was found in McGuire's locker, I mean, baseball could have said to the union, we want to have this guy tested because we found this pre steroid precursor in his locker, but they declined to do it. I didn't know that. Yeah, and then in your case, uh, your error mostly, 2003 was kind of the hallmark where, you know, you had the survey testing that, that set the whole thing or to, yeah, in motion so really, there weren't any rules about this anyway, right? Yeah, that's, I don't like saying that. I think everybody makes a decision. We all know, we all know that it wasn't right. And that's, that's that. I mean, we live with the consequences. I don't know, like, I've, everybody's like, well, everybody's doing it. I don't care. That's not real. I did my, I did what I did because I wanted to do it. That's it. I think it's very important not to just say, huh, group, because, you know, you got to be responsible for your own action. And that's. You got to live with it. Trust me. I mean, I've done a lot of good things in baseball, and in my head, I work my butt off for that. And does it matter what you guys think? Of course it does. But to me, I know what I've done, and I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. That was one of them. And if you live up to it, I think, hopefully, the young guys, the younger generation sees that. And you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth to go through it. We worked our whole life. And ever since I was four years old, I played baseball. And all of a sudden, because I made a mistake, it's going to be taken away from me. So I think it's, I don't like when it says everybody's doing it because it sounds like an excuse. And it was part of the, it was part of the game. I don't know how much or who did it. My biggest regret is because I think is the guys that didn't do it, you know, they get, they get put with them. There's a cloud over them too. I think that's the, my biggest regret, the whole thing. So let's, this was supposed to be a pitching panel, and we got sort of like <laughs> sidetracked on, on a lot of these issues, but which obviously, you know, really involved pitching. But why don't you tell you, both of you guys, uh, you know, Eric, you're now embarking on a, on a coaching career, and you're, you're working in the minor league system with, uh, you know, some kids in the Texas organization, I, I'm guessing hoping to move forward into more of a professional coaching career. And so you're here at this analytical conference because you want to learn more about how analytics apply, how the, all these numbers apply to the game, which is what you're bringing back and teaching the players. So why don't you explain to these guys what you're doing right now? Well, right now is I'm trying to take all the technology, to 3D, 3D cameras, the Rapsodo, the Trackman, everything else, and basically use that as a blueprint for me of teaching. And there's a lot of kids that can't really process all that information. For me, I feel like it's my job to really take that and really take that into teaching, really understand spin rate. What does that mean? What does that need to them? What does that need to me? What is that, you know, as a guy has a really high spin rate, can you throw a slider? Can you throw a splitter? Can you throw a changeup? And to me, I think I've noticed a lot that it helps me a little bit to almost eliminate pitches when I'm trying to teach someone or it's more of a blueprint. I see that as images. I see numbers as more images. And, you know, of course, I'm a little bit OCD, so I knew every single count, every single percentage of ball, pull, ball, hit the other way, high up in the air and everything else like that. And I knew that as a starter, that's probably why I wasn't that good, you know. As a reliever, I just went out there and I pitched with my strength. That was my biggest change from starter to reliever is just pitch with your strength. And uh, I think for me, that's my biggest role is the young kids. Like, there's so much out there, they get lost. I think for me, I'll be like more of a, the guy in metal where I can say, you know, this guy, that works better for him. Example, spin rate, example, angle, all these things that I can help them understand. Not so much understand, but I can help them basically build their mechanics or build their pitch repertoire or their, you know, while they pitch their certain hitters with that information. That's really why I'm here kind of, take that in and really translate that to the players. 
And uh, you know, Eddie, you're a little old, old, older school, and you know, you, you're a scout. And yeah. how do you basically the good scouts? And I considered you to be a, an excellent one. How do you take all this information now and meld it with mm. what you always did, and move forward into this world yeah. to uh, to be a complete scout and 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 really pick and and uh, you know recommend players. Well, yeah, you know, I, I think um, <clears throat> the whole analytics part of the equation is very important. I mean, if you, if, you know, I'll answer this question right now because I know I'm going to get it. How can I get into baseball in the front office in an analytic position? Obviously, contact all 30 clubs, even write up a review of their, their roster, who you like, who you don't like. Um, don't ignore other factors. You know, if a guy's ERA is a little higher, and he, but he wins games, he goes out there and pitches and... You know, quality, uh, quantity is a very important thing for me. And I think a lot of the analytics focuses a little bit too much on the qualitative, you know, I mean, I know this to be a fact. I've talked to major league players a lot this off season and it's getting to the point now where players and pitchers are pitching and playing to the numbers. They, they're not stupid. I mean, I was a player, Eric's a player. We might have been dumb, but we weren't stupid, okay? We know who's writing the checks. So if I increase my qualitative numbers, meaning my strikeouts per nine innings pitched, that I have a good chance of getting a better contract, I'm going to do it. You know, on a 2-2 pitch to the eight-hole hitter with the pitcher on deck, I'm pitching in the National League. In my day, it was like throw a fastball on the outer third of the plate. Hopefully he puts it in play. No, now I'm going to bounce a breaking ball, bounce another one. If he strikes out, great. If he walks, who cares? Now I strike out the pitcher. So my strikeouts per nine innings are going to go up. But by the fifth inning, you've got 110 pitches, 115 pitches. You're out of the game. So, I mean, that's why 755 pitchers have appeared. That's why only one team in Major League Baseball last year had more complete games than I did in one season, and I was terrible. I wasn't even that good. I mean, ask Barry, Barry about my war. It was, it was brutal. So <clears throat> it was there's fun. something to be said for qualitative numbers, I mean, quantitative numbers. I know one of the raps on Jack Morris, we all heard it, you know, his ERA was a little high, because I, 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 I watched Jack Morris pitch games where he's up 10 nothing in the sixth inning. He's throwing fastballs down the middle. And he wins a game 10-4 and goes nine innings. Now, if he tries to strike everybody out and he's out of the game in the sixth inning, up 10 nothing, all his qualitative numbers are going to go up. But someone's got to go out there 1,440 innings. That's why 755 pitchers appeared in the big leagues last year. So don't ever overlook the value of quantity as well. Because it's really amazing how few pitchers pitch 200 innings now or even 160 innings. You know, I mean, I threw close to... 200 innings one year. I didn't strike anybody out, but I didn't walk anybody. So my whip was excellent, you know? And, and to me, that's a very good judge of how effective you are as a starting pitcher. It's basically you're not getting hit and you're not walking people. So I, I think it's, you have to encompass everything. I know, don't get caught up in sitting in a dark room on a computer and just fretting over the qualitative numbers. Look who goes out there, you know? We have to start developing multiple inning relievers. We have to. You know, I've never seen, you never saw in my day, you never saw a right-handed reliever with more appearances than innings pitched, never. It was always a left-handed situational guy, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's half of them pitching 70 games, throw 65 innings. You know, really? I mean, you're up seven to one with two out in the eighth and you got to match up. You can't let that guy finish the inning. I mean, that's, we're heading for trouble in that regard because there just aren't that many pitchers on the planet Earth. You know, well, I think for me, the, you look at the Houston Astros, they're really, really big in analytics. And last year, they had no closer. I mean, if you look at matchups, and I think they went the last two, three games, they went with their guts. They went with their feeling, emotions. How, how is this guy pitching on the mound right now? If they really look at all analytics all the time, they would have made changes. They would have brought up different guys. They wouldn't have left Verlander in for nine innings either. Exactly. And so I think I, for me, it's, that's where we need to find a happy medium. Exactly. Where this is where we, old school guys, sit together and really understand what you guys are talking about. Like when we say, what is a gamer? I know what a gamer is. I know what a guy is giving me an extra inning, even though he's giving up three or four innings or three or four runs that inning. That might be a very valuable inning because my bullpen's been worn out the next day. There's no numbers for that. 
for me, it's important to understand that. And it goes both ways. That's when, if you have a good front office, they have a really good relationship with the coaches and the front office or the analytics. I think it's really where it needs to be now. I think it's, it's when I came in, Paul DiBodessa was my general manager, and it really started going that analytic part. I understand. There's always a change. There's always, okay, we're doing drastic on one way. But I think now it's the time where, all right, we know it's part of it. And it's really, really important, important part of it. But we can't forget the other side of it. The other side was the variables. All these things that come into play where we the old guys or the guys that actually played can't understand that. So it's, it can't be this or that. It's both. And we exactly. have to find a really happy, happy medium where it has to work together. Because if it doesn't, it's just going to be where you're going to be fighting on each side and nothing comes out of it. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things I thought reading about uh, FIP and No, you're just not in front of it. Button. There you go. <laughs> the thing about the BIP and you're FIP is... You're not very is analytical, are you? The word... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to talk analytics and I can't turn on my microphone. <laughs> uh, the thing that amazed me about those two stats, reading about them, is there's one word in both descriptions, and that's luck. Luck. A guy with a, a high BIP is not lucky. And, it just, and a guy with a, a higher FIP is not lucky because he has no control whatsoever over the ball after it's put in play. And I, I couldn't disagree more than with that. I mean, the name of the game for me to pitch in the major leagues, and, and watch on TV, it's command. Command is not walking people. Command is throwing the ball where you're aiming. I remember Mike Leak with, uh, with the Cincinnati Reds. The average grade for command is five. The average grade for control is five. Now, control is basically how many walks per innings pitched, okay? So if you're doing your, or your report and you have a template that say, okay, if this guy walks 2.8 to 3.1 hitters per nine innings, he has five control. That's not a debatable thing. You just put the number there. Now, command is different. Command is a little more, to use a, a crossword, well, you know, esoteric word. It's a little more complex than that. You almost have to eyeball it because there's really no number you can look at that says, okay, this guy's got plus command. And command is, does he throw the ball where he's aiming? That's what command is. And I tell young pitchers, and I'm sure Eric does too, you better, if you're going to throw the ball with your, where you're aiming, you better be aiming at something. Because, you know, he was a young pitcher at one time, and so was I. In high school, I threw 100 miles an hour, and I used to see three people standing in there, an umpire, some guy with a bat, and a guy with a mask and a glove, and I just, boom, and I got away with it. Aim big, miss big. Well, Aim small, miss small. So by the time I was doing well in the big leagues, I'm looking at a spot this big. I'm looking at that, the, the middle of the, the catcher's mitt. That's what I'm aiming at. And if I miss this much, that might be the difference between life and death. If I miss this much to Mike Schmidt on a fastball, if I'm aiming low and away and I throw it towards the middle of the plate and up, that, that ball's going to be hit so hard. So, I mean, look at command. Command of the breaking ball. Now, spin rate, if you think about it, if you go and see a really good minor league prospect and he's got plus spin rate on that breaking ball, invariably what he's doing, he's bouncing to... It's spinning like crazy, but no one's got to sing, uh, swing at it. Then he's hanging two, and then he throws one on the black that's absolutely unhittable. Then he bounces two, hangs two. So when you get to the big leagues, and I've talked to major league hitters about this, I said, what's the biggest difference? He said, it's the quality and the command of the breaking ball. So now you're up there as a right-handed hitter, and there's a left-hander on the mound, and it's two and one, and you're like, man, I'm geared up. Here comes a little breaking ball, loose little thing, but it's right there. Now it's two and two. That's the difference. Now the guy that can snap the stuff off and paint with it like this guy, then, then you got an all-star, you know? But the next time you're watching a pitcher on TV and you want to decide where do I meld the, the analytics with the scouting part of it, just see if he's hitting that catcher's glove. If that catcher's doing this, I see it every day. You know, I go to games every day and I see they're doing this, they're doing that. You can't miss by this much on your fastball and be successful. You can't do it. And what they're trying to do, they're all max effort, head snapping, and they're trying to strike everybody out because that looks real good in the analytics. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. It goes back to a guy's gun, are going to pitch to spin rate. 
strikeout. And to me, I'm like, I get in last year. I got a couple guys in the bullpen, really good guys with the Dodgers. I mean, they should never give up runs. They're throwing 100 mile an hour. Their stuff is so nasty. They're starting throwing up. I'm like, why are you throwing up first pitch? I mean, I don't understand why you're going up. It goes, oh, they can't hit. It, 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 it plays well up there. I'm like, it plays well up there when the time is right. Try it. So to me, that's the biggest thing is to make them understand if Actually, I, would, I wish they wouldn't understand anything. It would be easier for us to teach because, right. I mean, it's too much. I wish there was nothing that they knew so we could actually use it and actually translate it the right way. But it's too late for that a little bit. Yeah, they, but they, they wouldn't understand. They don't understand what pitching up or pitchability. They don't get that. It's important for me to really take this, take all that information. Yes, yeah, spin rate is really good. I think I have spin rate. We can see that. You can see what a a rising fastball, even if it never rises. We know what it is. We know what it looks like. Let but me, uh, guys need to really not pitch to that. Let me spin spin rate on fastballs to me is very important because you're throwing a fastball with high spin rate means heavy sink. So, I mean, but on breaking ball, you got to be careful. Careful of that. Can he command it? The, uh, let me throw this out there because on FIP, to your point, I had this conversation with Zach Krenke a couple of years ago, and, you know, Zach is really one of the most intelligent pitchers that I've ever talked to. I mean, when you can get him to narrow down on, you know, on, on, on a subject, he's very attentive and very intelligent. And so we talked about FIP, and what he said was for a few years, he, he pitched to FIP. Yeah. And that basically is FIP is walks, strikeouts, and home runs, home runs. Not anything that a pitcher has control over, which I beg to differ. I don't think pitchers have control over that either because – it's, it, the umpire calls the zone. You may not have control over whether it's called a ball or a strike, but and the pitch you that, you, that that you let up for the home run. But be that as it may, he said that when he pitched to FIP, and he his ERA went up, and then he finally just said, "Enough of this. I'm not pitching to FIP anymore." And he went back to normal, just trying to throw the best pitch he could on every pitch, and his ERA went back down, and all yeah. his numbers went back down again. So the, one of the questions, and you brought it up, Eric, is how much do these guys actually absorb all these things? It's, it's so much information to give them, you know, and, 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 the, and you sit, I, you have meetings, behind meetings, and, they, you know, especially with the shifts on where you have to play, where you have to pitch to in a shift for it to work, how much do they actually absorb? Too much. I mean, yeah. the problem is they just don't understand it. That's why I'm here. I want to make sure I understand it so I can actually explain that, that we talked about spin rate. Sometimes spin rate doesn't mean it sinks. Sometimes less spin sinks. That's why Rapsodo and the sinkers, you don't use it. You know, it doesn't mean the same thing. It depends on the spin axis. All these things that they don't understand. So for me, it's too much info for them. That's why we come into play as coaches or teachers, whatever you want to call it, to really, really make sure that there's no such divide because they're going, oh, spin there, spin there, I'm going up. No, that's not what it means. That means when you're 0-2, you have a chance to go up. You can. That's all this means. But understand that they know that too. The other team knows that. So then it comes into play like, all right, are you smart enough to understand that they do know that too? So I think there's a lot, and I think there's too much for the players. For us, that's fine. We don't play. We don't need to execute. That's perfect. We need to really understand that. Certain guys can actually take, Granky's really smart. There's guys that can actually take that, and then you know what doesn't work, they'll throw it away. That's fine. There's a lot of young kids, though, which is right now this game is going younger and younger. That's why we need to really be careful with them because we're going to load it up. They don't understand, and they don't understand what to do with it. For me, it's important to really understand that. And front office need to get that, too. I mean, I understand you need to find the right guys to fill in the holes, write contracts and all that stuff. I totally understand that. But as a teacher, as a guy on the field, we really need to make sure that that information is really filtered right for those guys cause, and understand what they can understand. Yeah. I think if you, if you have a goal for a season, you have an 18-year-old high school kid, little Johnny from Omaha, signed in the second round, right-handed pitcher. He comes in the rookie ball after he signs in June. If you, over the next three months, can get him to the point where he's concentrating on commanding his fastball, boy, he has just built a foundation. Am I right, Eric? I mean, you cannot pitch if you can't command your fastball. And I'm talking about throwing it where you're aiming. So not missing even this much 
is death. And you'll get away with it in the minor leagues. You get to the big leagues, you're going to get hammered if you miss this much. So your goal should be to, to never miss more than this much. And you know how difficult that is from 60 feet away throwing a baseball consistently? But you watch guys like Johnny Cueto and you watch the way they throw on the side. I mean, they never miss. It's there with the breaking ball. It's with the fastball. I mean, if you just tell them that, work on that. Don't worry about FIP. You know, analytics are, are great if you can sit back here with them, okay. let the players p perform the way they're going to perform, and then you interject to evaluate how they perform. But when you've interjected it before they're performing and now they're pitching or hitting to those numbers, it affects situational baseball. You know, think about it. I mean, it's July. You're out. You're 22 games out. Your, your front office is sending the message that, as Scott Boris would say, we're, it's a race to the bottom. We're going to get those high draft picks. You know, we're going to do the Houston Cubs model. We're going to lose 100 games three years in a row, and we're going to draft the best position players, and then we're going to buy the pitching. Well, that's, that's great. That's a great plan if you have $300 million sitting around doing nothing. But, well, you know, Tampa that, Bay can't do that. But that's what the Cubs did. That's what the Cubs did. Right. But look what they spent. They had the money. That's why I think Ricketts, to me, is one of the best owners in the game. He, you know, he allowed those guys to tear it down. And then when it came time to get Lackey and, you know, they got Arietta already, but Lester and the group, you know, here's $300 million. That's great, you know. But uh, my point is, it's July. Your team is losing. There's a man on second. There's nobody out. The hitter's up there. It's a tie game in the eighth inning. In a situational world, he should be trying to move that runner over. And he's thinking, all right, I hit a, I hit a ground ball second base, move that guy over with one out. Even if he scores, my OPS goes down. So why not, I'll just try to drive him in. I'll try to hit the ball out of the park, because if I strike out, it's the same effect on my OPS than if I moved him over. So analytics have had an effect on situational baseball. They really have. So, I mean, I think it's a very valuable tool, but it's a little disturbing when players are starting to play to the numbers rather than trying to win the game. Well, let's get to, uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, and. I've got a whole slew of questions here. Let's get to a few of them. This is a good one. Do you believe that teams need to name a closer? Or are you of the opinion that more than one player on a team is capable of closing? Eric, as a closer? I believe in momentum. Basically, if you lose a game in the ninth inning, I believe that it does have a little bit of an effect the next day. I do believe that as an anchor. At first, you got to understand, like, do I need to name a closer? First of all, do I have a closer? You know, <laughs> do me. I actually do have a closer? That's the first question, I think, as a front office. Do I have someone I can actually rely on? No matter what we wins or fail, he's still going to be strong enough to come back every single day, give me the best out of it. To me, I believe in the roles in the back end of the bullpen. I'm talking about two guys, not four or five guys. Mm -hmm. But then again, you're going back to the starting. If they go four innings, then you need three guys out there that can go multiple innings. You know, the five plus one guy or the six-man rotation, all this stuff. There's a lot that comes into play. That there are a lot of variables, two, three days, four or five days in a row. When do we have the, the seven-day DL? To me, you need a closer. No matter what, it's almost like you're calming influence in the bullpen or where it just takes away from the manager. I know Jim Tracy, he's probably the best manager for me I've seen managing bullpen. We knew what to expect. We knew when we were going to get up. We got up on our own sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, we knew who was going to be ready. And I think mentally, I know it might not be statistically you can improve it, but mentally in the bullpen, I think we had the best bullpen for that reason. We had roles, and we knew our roles, and we tried, you know, everybody wanted to get the best. Everybody wants to be the closer. I get that. But I think you need to name someone almost as your captain in the back end of the bullpen, and I think it's important for you, just for your anchor. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I see it all the time. I hear fans around me. The, the setup guy comes in a two to one game and faces three guys and gets them out like bing, bang, boom. And here comes the closer for the ninth. Well, why didn't he just leave him in? You know, he should have left him. He was great. And as a GM, I'm sitting there thinking, boy, I'll tell you what, if I don't put him in for the ninth inning and I leave that eighth inning guy in there, boy, that agent's going to be on the horn to me tomorrow. And he's going to be in the manager's office screaming bloody murder. So there is a human element to this thing, you know. Those managers don't operate in a vacuum. But to answer the question, I think it's very important if, like Eric said, when I was in the bullpen with Davey Johnson in 1984, 85, when that phone rang, and if everybody knew who was getting up, that's a pretty good manager. Like you said, the phone rang, the phone rings at an inning, guy gets up, he knows it's him. So that's, that's like the greatest 
testament to a manager when the phone rings and everybody in that bullpen knows who's getting up. This is your slot. And just to add my own two cents on it, uh, Bud Black, who, you know, is a pretty darn good pitcher and pretty darn good manager, and I had this discussion, and his, his, his thesis on it was that you, you start your pitching staff with a number one starter and a lights out closer, and then you build your pitching staff inward out from there. I mean, if you look back over the course of recent years have been strange, but I mean, the Cubs probably don't win the World Series two years ago if they didn't make that deal for Chapman. Yep. And then, you know, they had, uh, the, the Astros had a couple of guys who were their closers, but you know, they weren't, uh, they just didn't work out during the season. So they wound up using Charlie Morton and guys to close down big games in, in the postseason. Yeah. And that was what you were talking about. You know, uh, even all, though, bets, all bets are off in the postseason. Yeah, even we got though, Randy Johnson coming in on no day's rest to pitch the eighth right. inning of the seventh game of the even world. I mean, all, all bets are off the table in the postseason. Right. And even though the Astros are as analytic as everybody, you know, they let AJ make those decisions from the gut when he had to make those decisions. Whereas I thought the Dodgers really didn't. Their whole decision to take Rich Hill out in the, after four innings of game yeah. two, having thrown 60 pitches, I think set up the whole loss of the it, World it, Series. It was the beginning of the end in that game, in my opinion. I think because the whole, they had somebody on the mound later that they didn't want on the mound. Right. If he had gone six innings, he wouldn't have been on the mound. And they had to bring in Kenley Jensen early. That's right. And so he wound up letting up the home run that tied the game. That's right. And then the whole series changed because of it. Everything changed right there for me. Right. And that was done above Dave Roberts' head by, oh, of course by all the guys in oh, the yeah. front office. And that was Plus the guy's making like $16 million And he's got four innings and 60 pitches. You're done. Right, exactly. Hey, right. Where do I apply for that job? I, <laughs> you sound like Goose. Uh, here's another one. Do I you sound like Goose? <laughs> yeah, because he, he, he's I hope always, I'm a little more articulate. Than <laughs> but you're basically calling just, people names. He, he's, <laughs> he's always been the. Uh, yeah, I wish I, I, I. He pitched three innings, saves. Oh God! Yeah, and he goes, he still would be pitching if he had Rivera and Hoffman's jet workload. But you know, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay, so here's another one. Do you do you think teams over rely on pitch counts? Do you think pitchers adjust their performance wow. because of the pitch counts? Well, well, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I was a general manager, I used to ask scouts, you know, would you have a pitch count? What would your pitch count be in, in the minor, say the minor leagues? Okay. Well, the first thing, a lot, of, a lot of, you know, the guys who were my age back then, well, I'm 1964. I walked four miles through the snow to get to a game and threw 280 pitches. <laughs> so you wouldn't have any pitch counts whatsoever? No, I didn't say that. Well, I'm asking you, you know? You've got to have pitch counts, certainly in the minor leagues. Um, you know, because you're going to have that, that $10 million college pitcher come into A ball and that manager is trying to win the Florida State League and he's going to leave him out there for 140 pitches. You can't, that cannot happen. So there's a part of it that's there. In the big leagues, I, I, you know, pitchers can't throw like we used, we used to throw. You know, they can't throw as many pitches as we used to throw. I don't know why. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I look at the strength and conditioning regimen they're under, and it's unbelievable. I mean, you're going to got to try to kill Osama bin Laden, or you're going to try to go win a game, you know? I mean, come on. <laughs> well, so, that was a non sequitur. So, I mean, <laughs> what's that? What did you say? That was a non sequitur. <laughs> yeah, non sequitur. So, uh, you know, um, I think pitch counts have to, be, have to be there. You know, obviously different pitch counts for different type of players. You've got a free agent pitcher. It's after the trade deadline. He's a free agent at the end of the year. Here we go, man. <laughs> You're pitching, brother. 150. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's, it has to be in the game. Have they gotten too low? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Guys throw too many pitches. That's, that's the thing. I mean, if you put 120 pitch count on a guy and he's got that after five innings, yeah, you got to take him out. But we used to get through games with 110 pitches. And it all goes back to this max that's, effort trying yeah. to strike everybody well, out. Well, that's the example of they don't believe in sp pitch strikes. They don't believe in getting people out, throw to contact. They're pitching to strikeouts. Well, there you go. That's a negative. Then, you, then you cost yourself, uh, you go four innings, and you cost yourself about five, six million dollars a year because you can't get to 200 innings. 200 innings, you get 20 million dollars. Tell those guys that. They'll, they'll do that. But teams don't want that either because uh, it's expensive. So I don't know if it's, uh, 
you know, pitch counts, pitch count. I think for me, you know, you got to go back a little bit and really understand the players. Every player is different. I mean, I understand pitch count. I think, yeah. you know, for me, pit throw strikes, and you don't have to worry about your pitch count. Yeah, I mean, to have Jamie Moyer and Nolan Ryan have the same pitch count is ridiculous. It's ludicrous. So, I mean, you should – each individual guy should have his own – starter should have his pitch count. Almost like your credit score, you know, you put a sign around my neck, you know, my, my number is 105. I get to throw 105, <laughs> you know, and then you got the college senior who throws 80 miles an hour. His number's like 230, you know. Well, you know, the other thing is that uh, when we had Sandy Alderson last year at our summer conference in, in New York, and we were talking about the change in hitting, and, you know, his thesis on it is that the approach to the plate of the hitters is so much different now that that has a, a huge impact on pitch counts because guys just dig in and they'll foul balls away in a count, you know, and, and take you deep into your pitch count very early, especially if you don't get a first and second strike. Mm. And then, you know, I think you were mentioning it earlier, if you look at just throwing strike one and strike two, the actual numbers, batting averages go down significantly later in the count if you're ahead in the count no and vice versa they go up no doubt concurrently you know with uh, the amount of uh, how deep in the count you are in a two or three ball count so, yeah i mean you know the old mantra when i was playing do not stay away from two and one three and oh counts three and one two and oh three and one two stay out of those counts because you no one is going to be successful so we it was always strike one and, you know, I remember Joe Torrey before my first start in the big leagues. He said, I want you to throw fastballs low and away until you, you have to throw something else. So I throw fastballs low and away, and if they're continuing to hit rockets right at people, I just keep doing it. Now, if the bases are loaded in the second inning and, you know, I've got to start doing this, fine. But Eric and I were talking. I can't tell you how many times I go to a game and the leadoff hitter's up and the starting pitcher throws every pitch he has to the leadoff hitter, everything he's got. You know, back in the day, it was fastballs, and then the second and third time through, you start them off with this one, you know? It was part of the game, the plan of getting late into the, the game. And I think that's been lost a little bit, and it's sad. So here's a good one, you know, quickly, um, you know, with what's gone on with Otani this spring here. Uh, and, you know, he really hasn't played up so far to his capabilities, I think. Otani? Yeah. I saw two at-bats, and they were not very good. Right. So, I mean, and also, you know, pitching-wise, he hasn't pitched very well. I haven't seen him. Well, he let up, like, six runs and six hits against three, in three innings against a Mexican League minor league team the wow. other day. So it hasn't worked out really well, but that's not really the point. The point is the Angels decided in advance they were going with a six-man rotation because of Otani coming over from Japan where they work in six-man rotations. What do you guys think about the six-man rotation? Well, I mean, if you look at putting together a roster, here's another thing, you know, analytics-wise. When you're GM, it's roster management is huge, you know. So now seems to be 13 pitchers seems to be something that people are doing. 12 is probably the norm now. But think about it. You're an American League club. When I was with Toronto, we had 13 pitchers opening day. We have nine regulars. That's 22. you got a three-man bench. One of them has to play center field. One of them has to be able to catch, and one has to play shortstop. Unless you have guys on the field that can do that. I don't know how many teams have a guy on the field who go behind the plate and catch, so you got to have to have a catcher. I don't know how many teams, second baseman or third baseman, can play shortstop, so you got to have a shortstop. Now, you got a better chance of a corner guy maybe to play center field for an inning or two, but, you know, there's a lot of – if now with a six-man rotation, you got five guys sitting there who are not eligible to pitch that day, not, you know, and you got – it's going to put more stress on your bullpen, I will say that. I mean, wide. the six-man rotation, I don't understand it because you have the seven-day DL that you use and abuse now. So I don't get that part. I mean, you have days off that you can actually manage. So you actually need four starters the first month. So I understand the Otani part where, you know, we're playing an extra 20-some games here, I think, and the wear and tear is a lot higher, I think, pitching and hitting. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how he reacts his body. He's only, what, 23 years old? I can't wait to see in five, six years of wear and tear. He's got the nap body. I mean, he's going to hit batting practice and throw, and I only threw one inning. I was worn out. So I don't know how that's going to work out. But I think, I mean, the six-man rotation, eh, I don't know. I don't believe in it. And you got Cole Hamill hates it, too. It's going to change everybody else's rotation. That's going to be another variable that we don't really understand yet. And, uh it's going to be different. I mean, guys are used to a certain routine that 
we are a creature of habits. I mean, there's a reason why we wear the same stuff all day. There's a reason why we're all OCD. Because we like to do our things the right the way we like to do it. Mm -hmm. And mentally, I think we get in a certain place that if we get out of it, you know, if you pitch once a week, how do you get into a rhythm? How do you, you know, wow. people, do you understand rhythm? Do you understand, yeah. you know, winning streak? It's the same thing. It's rhythm. You know, momentum really does matter in baseball. I understand that it's, you can't put it in paper, but it is there. It happens. It exists. And uh, to me, that's very hard to find. I think it's going to be more of a reliever, you know, off the bench, maybe DH. I think that would be more realistic in the long run, but we'll see. I mean, maybe he is that special. Well, in his, in his defense, I will say one thing. When Ichiro came over here in 2001, he was so brutal. I mean, he was cleaning out the third base dugout like every at bat. He was late. He was bailing. I remember talking to Lou Pinella, his manager, like, who signed this guy? Jesus. You know, he was terrible. And look what he did. Was well, he setting I mean, everybody up? I don't know. But the hitting guys on the Mariners were running for cover. They wanted no part of this guy because this guy's never going to hit. Well, he I mean, to, 3, 000, would you would guess he hit 3,000 U.S. hits? Yeah, I mean, in his behalf, uh, you know, he came over with a 10-year or 9-year accomplished record in Japan. Yeah, but and he so, was brutal. Right, it, for, in that period. Yeah. But then Tanaka came over, offered a 24-0 and zero year for the Yankees, and he had a fabulous spring and a fabulous first half of the season until he, his elbow got hurt. Yeah. He was like 11 and 1 when his elbow went down. No, my so, point is don't judge right. him too harshly. The, the right. sample is too small. But he's also missed most of last year with injuries, too. I mean, you know, he only threw 25 innings and he had 200 at bats. And so, you know, he's coming off of, uh, of a year like that. Yeah. But let's just have one more question and we'll, and we'll uh, finish it up. So to bring it back around, I uh, asked as, as former pitchers, what are some of the gaps in the current sabermetric narrative that you would like to see be investigated in the future? Well, well, things I talked about just, and it's going to take a lot of work. You know, how often on fastballs does this guy miss the glove? You know, what is his average miss per pitch or something like that? Because it, it measures command. You know, I mean, it's, does he throw the ball where he's aiming? And I think the other thing is a quality, I mean, quantitative, you know, guys that give you innings, that give you, even if they're not the greatest innings, look at the situation. Look, why is he pitching this way? He gave up three runs. Well, he was up 12 nothing. you know. Be a little more cognizant of situations than just totally ignoring it and looking at it as you know, in a laboratory environment. There's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of data, a lot of uh, new New technology that I think it's really, really good. I love it. I mean, it gives us a little bit to work with for the guys, and sometimes you can actually use it mentally for them. Just tell me he has great spin rate. He's going to be happy. You know, you can use it that way. But I think what's lacking is just uh, the communication between the two. That's all. I think it's, yeah. I mean, just to really us learn the baseball guy, learn and sit down. I really, I sit down with R&D guys and the analytics guys, try to understand. I mean, I think that's, there's been a wedge, I think, between the front office and the baseball guys, I think we need to really fill that out. I think that's because there's so much good information out there, and you guys need to be understood and exactly the same. You guys need to understand us too. So I think it's, I think that's maybe the one thing lacking. Other than that, I mean, I love all the new technology. Like you said, it grows the game, it makes the game a lot more interesting, and uh, you know, just gets more graphic on TV. Yeah, I, I got to illustrate this point. Just one last quick story. Lefty Gomez was in our clubhouse when I was a Cub player in 1987. I'm, of course, I'm the only guy who knew who he was. I'm like, Lefty Gomez, holy Christ, you know, so I run over there and I'm, I'm asking him, you know, about, hey, how'd you get to the ballpark? Did he give you meal money? I'm asking him a lot of stupid questions. Then I said to him, like an idiot I am, I said, you know, I noticed that your ERA in 1936 was 4.39. It's a little high. And you won a lot of games, 13 and 7. 13 and 7, 4.39. And he said, uh, we'd be up 12 nothing, and men on base. I'd pitch from the windup with guys on base because he didn't give it. Go steal second and third. We're up 12 runs, and I got, you know, you know, I got, you know, Lou Gehrig coming up next inning, you know, and Joe DiMaggio. So he pitched to the situation. Now he would have been that would have hurt him analytically. Now I'm not saying guys do that now, but the good ones are not going to get themselves in trouble with a huge lead by nibbling or trying to strike people out. So just try to be cognizant of that. Well, I mean, I, I think this was uh, a very. Uh eclectic and uh, in-depth, uh, you know, panel. I mean, I think it's important for all you guys that 
at times we listen to the people who are on the field and played the game and how they absorb all this and, and translate it into the way they project their own career, what they did in their own career, and what they're doing now in their, in, in their jobs subsequently to playing. And I think that's all, you know, to me, very, very ed educational. So I, I want to thank Ed Lynch and Eric Gagne. I think this was terrific, and I'm glad you guys were here. Thank you. Thank you.